Good day and welcome to Big Bad Tech. I'm your instructor, Jim Pytel. Today's topic of discussion is directional control valves. My objective is to introduce directional control valves and discuss their purpose, construction, and method of operation as applied to fluid power systems. A valve is a fluid power device designed to modify pressure, flow rate, or flow direction. A subset of these valves, those that modify flow direction, are appropriately called directional control valves. Directional control valves are designed to stop, start, and change direction of flow in a fluid power circuit. Which position a directional control valve assumes ultimately influences the actuation direction of a fluid power actuator. Directional control valves are best introduced using a progressive examination of the schematic symbols that make them up. We'll start out slow and increase the speed intensity as we go along. First, valves are ordinarily drawn schematically as boxes where each box is an independent position the valve can assume. Each valve position performs a particular function. Since this schematic symbol has two boxes, this valve is a two position valve. Ports or ways are the entry and exit points to a valve. This is a two position, two way valve. Different manufacturers and applications might use different labels. However, we'll just call these ports one and two. Internal to the position boxes, directional control valves use a range of symbols to represent selectively connected or disconnected ports. Arrows from one port to another means an open passageway is established between the two ports and fluid can flow. Unidirectional arrows mean flow is intended to be unidirectional, whereas bidirectional arrows mean flow can be bidirectional. A dead end T means that that port is not connected and no fluid can flow. Other symbols internal to the position boxes, like check valves and restrictions, exist. However, let's limit this introductory analysis to simply unidirectional and bidirectional arrows implying connection and dead end T's implying no connection. Once we examine the cutaway of a directional control valve, I'll come back and explain how check valves and flow control valves internal to a position box work. As previously discussed, each valve position performs a specific function. This position closes the path from one to two and fluid cannot flow. This position opens a bidirectional path from one to two through which fluid can flow. Shifting a valve from position to position is the act of moving internal components like poppets, sliding plates, or spools to selectively connect or disconnect ports via the internal passageways machined into the valve body. Repositioning the movable components is known as the act of actuating the valve. Actuation methods include, but are not limited to, manual levers, foot pedals, push buttons, mechanical linkages, thermostats, electrical solenoids, pressure pilot, or a combination of these methods, like a solenoid-initiated, pilot-actuated valve, as is commonly illustrated for poppet-style solenoid-operated directional control valves. I know this barrage of actuation methods and symbols may have hit you like a swarm of Africanized bees, but I find it helpful to divide these into two general families, manual and automatic. Manual methods like levers, pedals, and buttons all require a human operator to physically move the valve and the internal components into a new position. Automatic methods like mechanical linkages, thermostats, pressure pilots, and electrical solenoids don't necessarily require a human operator to physically move the valve into a new position, but do so automatically. I'll further simplify your task by winnowing down this swarm into a much more manageable load. Most of the content in this playlist uses manual levers and electrical solenoids. If you can remember just these two actuation methods, you'll do just fine. A manual lever operated valve requires an operator to physically push or pull the valve into a new position. A solenoid operated valve uses an electrical solenoid, a type of linear electrical actuator to physically push or pull the valve into a new position. We'll deal with some of the electrical characteristics of solenoid operated valves in later lectures. This particular valve is actuated by an electrical solenoid. The act of actuating a valve to a new position implies the valve had an initial deactivated position to begin with. Valves use return springs that either offset or center a valve to an initial deactivated position. This example valve is spring offset into the normally closed position such that the valve does not ordinarily conduct fluid. 
the electrical solenoid must be energized to push the valve into the open position for fluid to flow. The full description of this directional control valve is a two-position, two-way, solenoid-actuated, spring-offset, normally-closed directional control valve. Such a valve can be used to turn on or off or isolate sections of a larger fluid power system. In the absence of an electrical pilot signal, fluid flow is blocked. In the presence of an electrical pilot signal, fluid can flow. Consider a subtle modification of this valve and see if you can put your newfound knowledge of directional control valves to the test. By all means, pause the lecture and see if you can determine the number of positions, the number of ways, the actuation method, and deactivated state of this directional control valve. This directional control valve is almost identical to our first example, with one major exception. It is also a two-position, two-way, solenoid-actuated directional control valve. However, it is spring offset into a normally open position. The behavior of this valve is fundamentally different than our first example. In the absence of an electrical pilot signal, fluid can flow. In the presence of an electrical pilot signal, fluid flow is blocked. Let a comparison of these two valves in a sample hydraulic circuit demonstrate that a misreading of the schematic symbol can have dire consequences. Consider these two directional control valves in a portion of a hydraulic circuit making use of an accumulator, a type of hydraulic energy storage device. I know we haven't discussed accumulators yet, but you can think of them as the hydraulic equivalent of a battery. Accumulators store pressurized fluid for the purposes of maintaining system pressure, absorbing shocks, compensating for thermal expansion and contraction, developing fluid flow and controlling noise. Accumulators can be a source of hazardous stored hydraulic energy, even when the pump is de-energized. Note the directional control valve on the right, in its deactivated state, is spring offset to the open position. When the solenoid is de-energized, this directional control valve would dump the accumulator to tank. It only keeps the accumulator from bleeding down in its activated or opposite state. This type of directional control valve might be suitable for an application that removes the hazardous stored energy in the accumulator when the solenoid is depowered. In contrast, the directional control valve on the left, in its deactivated state, is spring offset to the closed position. When the solenoid is de-energized, the directional control valve keeps the accumulator from bleeding down, maintaining the stored energy. This one only dumps the accumulator to tank in its activated or opposite state. This directional control valve might be suitable for an application that needs to make use of the stored energy in the accumulator when the system undergoes an emergency shutdown. An example might be the hydraulic system used to pitch modern horizontal axis wind turbine blades into or out of the wind. An emergency shutdown requires the wind turbine spill wind and aerodynamically break the rotor. This type of directional control valve would allow the stored energy in the accumulator to be used for this purpose. A misreading of the schematic symbols can have life-threatening consequences. The directional control valve on the right in its deactivated state dumps the accumulator. The directional control valve on the left in its deactivated state keeps the accumulator charged. Any technician assuming the system is okay to work on in its deactivated state runs the risk of being injured or killed by the stored hydraulic energy in the accumulator. It is for this reason that some automatically actuated directional control valves incorporate a means of manually overriding the valve's deactivated state. The schematic symbol for a manual override looks like a top hat laid on its side. In the absence of a pilot electrical signal or in the event of a damaged solenoid coil, an operator can push or pull the manual override to actuate the valve. The manual override on the normally closed valve would dump the pressurized fluid in the accumulator to tank. Manual overrides may or may not feature a detent that locks the valve in the new position. Let's again put your newfound knowledge of directional control valves to the test. By all means, pause the lecture and see if you can determine the number of positions, the number of ways, the actuation method, and the deactivated state of this directional control valve. This is a two-position, three-way, manually actuated directional control valve spring offset to a deactivated position that blocks flow at three and allows bidirectional flow from one to two. In its activated state, 
and allows bidirectional flow from two to three and blocks flow at one. Given these arrows are bidirectional, consider a couple of the creative ways this valve can be put to use. Consider configuration of this valve, making use of port two as the pressure port, port one as the input to system A, and port two as the input to system B. We have in effect created a selector valve. In the deactivated state, pressurized flow is routed to system A. In the activated state, pressurized flow is routed to system B. Thus the valve is selecting which port and system receives pressurized flow. Note I've not included a pressure relief valve on the pump to keep this diagram simple. Two position, three-way directional control valves are commonly used to control the actuation direction of single acting cylinders. Consider configuration, making use of port one as the tank port, port two as the actuator port for a spring retracted, hydraulically extended single acting cylinder, and port three as the pressure port. The spring offset deactivated position blocks the pressure port while the actuator port is drained to tank, allowing the spring force to retract the rod. When the valve is actuated into the second position, pressurized flow is routed to the single acting cylinder and the cylinder extends. When an operator releases the manual lever, the return spring offsets the valve such that the spring force retracts the cylinder. Alternatively, consider a swapped configuration making use of port one as the pressurized port, port two as the actuator port for the same spring retracted, hydraulically extended single acting cylinder, and port three as the tank port. The spring offset deactivated position routes pressurized flow to the single acting cylinder and the cylinder extends. When the valve is actuated into the second position, the pressure port is blocked while the actuator port is drained to tank, allowing the spring force to retract the rod. When an operator releases the manual lever, the return spring offsets the valve such that pressurized flow is routed to the single acting cylinder and the cylinder extends. Note these two different configurations using the same valve and the same actuator have essentially opposite functionality. The first one's deactivated state is a retracted cylinder that only extends when the operator manually actuates the valve. The second one's deactivated state is an extended cylinder that only retracts when the operator manually actuates the valve. Both these configurations need hydraulic pressure to extend the rod. However, their initial deactivated state is opposite because the valve has been configured differently. Since both these applications require hydraulic pressure to extend the cylinder, this really wouldn't be my actuator of choice for fail-safe braking applications. A loss of hydraulic pressure for either of these systems would not extend the cylinder and apply the brakes. For this reason, consider yet another type of two-position, three-way directional control valve controlling a spring-extended, hydraulically retracted, single-acting cylinder. In the absence of an electrical signal, this particular two-position, three-way, solenoid-actuated directional control valve dumps the rod end of the spring-extended, hydraulically retracted, single-acting cylinder to tank, and the spring keeps the rod extended, thus applying the brake. In the presence of an electrical signal, the directional control valve shifts to the second position, which allows pressurized flow to enter the rod end and retract the cylinder, thereby removing the brake. This system therefore requires both hydraulic pressure and the electrical signal to remove the brakes. All systems must be operational for the brake to be removed. When the electrical signal is lost, the spring offset valve applies the brakes. Even if the electrical signal is present, the loss of hydraulic pressure sees the extension spring apply the brakes. We'll examine fail-safe braking applications in later lectures. Note for certain valve applications, not all ports are necessary. Purposely plugged or blocked ports are represented schematically as X's. In this configuration, this two-position, three-way solenoid actuated directional control valve has essentially been repurposed into a two-position, two-way solenoid actuated directional control valve spring offset into the normally closed position. When actuated by the solenoid, the valve would open a passageway between the two unplugged ports and route pressurized flow to our system. Here's yet another specimen from the directional control valve zoo for you to identify. By all means, pause the lecture and see if you can determine the number of positions, the number of ways, the actuation method, 
in the deactivated state of this directional control valve. This is a two-position, four-way, manually actuated directional control valve spring offset into something called the cross-connect position, for obvious reasons. The cross-connection routes P to B and A is routed to T. The other position is called a straight-through connection, again, for obvious reasons. If an operator manually shifted the valve to the straight-through position, P is routed to A and B is routed to T. These type of valves are commonly employed to influence the position of a double-acting hydraulic cylinder. Customarily, the A port of a valve is routed to the cap end of a cylinder, although this isn't always the case. In this application, the spring offset cross-connect position keeps the cylinder retracted by routing pressurized flow to the rod end and dumping the cap end to tank. When manually actuated into the straight-through position, the cylinder extends. Pressurized flow is routed to the cap end and the rod end is dumped to tank. When an operator releases the manual lever, the spring offset returns the valve to the cross-connect position and fully retracts the cylinder. Note this particular two-position, four-way directional control valve only offers full extension and full retraction. There's no way the hydraulic cylinder can be paused mid-extension or retraction. We'll discuss other valve configurations in a moment that allow the cylinder to be stopped in mid-stroke and maintain the position or allow it to be manually repositioned. Note that spring offsets aren't the only way directional control valves used to position and reposition the valve. Consider something known as a detent. Detents behave radically different than return springs. It's probably a good idea to compare and contrast the two. Note that the previous spring offset valve only asserted the straight through position when the operator was in the act of actively pushing on the manual lever. Otherwise, the spring offset takes over and asserts the cross connect position. Detents, in contrast, are kind of like mechanical latches that once a valve has been pushed into one position, it remains in that position until the valve is actuated again into the other position. Detents can therefore be used to continually assert one position. Detents are schematically represented as kind of a bar with a notch. The notch holds the valve in the new asserted state until the valve is pushed into the new position. Detents are commonly used to assist operators using manually actuated valves. The classic example being a log splitter. An operator places a log in the splitter pushes the manual lever to place the detented valve in the straight through position and the cylinder extends. The operator can now take their hands off the manual lever and reposition the log or do other things while the detent keeps the valve in the straight through position. Only when an operator moves the valve back into the cross connect position does the cylinder retract. Alternatively, slightly more sophisticated automatic detents release the spool to the original position when pressure reaches a predetermined amount. The pressure at which this occurs is sometimes known as kickout, and it can be fixed or variable depending upon the application. As applied to the log splitter example, an operator would place the log in the splitter, actuate the manual lever to place the detented valve into the straight through position. The operator can now take their hands off the manual lever and reposition the log or do other things while the detent keeps the valve in the straight through position. When the cylinder reaches the limits of travel, pressure rises to the kickout and the automatic detent releases the valve to the cross-connect position and the cylinder retracts without the necessity of reactuating the manual lever. Solenoid-operated valves can also be detented. Consider a two-position, four-way, double solenoid-actuated valve with a detent. Notice no return spring offsets this valve into a particular deactivated state and the use of not one, but two solenoids. In this configuration, solenoid A pushes the valve into the straight through position and the detent just keeps it there. Even if solenoid A is de-energized, the valve remains in the straight through position. In contrast, solenoid B pushes the valve into the cross connect position and the detent just keeps it there. Even if solenoid B is de-energized, the valve remains in the cross connect position. Applications for this type of detented valve include clamping a lifted object. If electrical power is lost, the detented valve ensures the object remains clamped and doesn't drop to the floor and shatter into a million sharp pieces. Given the loss of electrical power would not return this valve to a predetermined deactivated state, but rather mechanically maintain the last randomly asserted state, safety considerations must be taken into account when servicing this system.
Here's yet another specimen from the directional control valve zoo for you to identify. By all means, pause the lecture and see if you can determine the number of positions, the number of ways, the actuation method, and the deactivated state of this directional control valve. This particular valve is a three position, four way, spring centered, manually actuated directional control valve. Two opposing springs serve to center rather than offset this three position valve into what is known as a closed center position. Just one of the many commonly available center positions. The closed center serves to disconnect all passages from one another. An operator can use the manual lever to actuate the valve into the straight through position or actuate it into the cross connect position. As previously, the double acting cylinder cap end is routed to actuator port A and the rod end routed to actuator port B. This directional control valve can influence the actuation direction of a double acting cylinder. If an operator moved the valve into the straight through position, pressurized flow would be routed to the cap end of the cylinder, the rod end would dump to tank, and the cylinder would extend. If an operator released the lever, the opposing return springs would center the valve in the closed position. If an operator moved the valve to the cross connect position, pressurized flow would be routed to the rod end of the cylinder, the cap end would be dumped to tank, and the cylinder would retract. Again, if an operator released the manual lever, the opposing return springs would center the valve in the closed center position. Note in contrast to our earlier two position four way valve, an operator can now stop the cylinder in mid stroke using the closed center position. Given the closed center position disconnects all ports from one another, consider how this affects the system from two vantage points. One from the perspective of actuator ports A and B, and two from the perspective of the P and T ports. From the perspective of the actuator ports A and B, the closed center position blocks flow to and from both the cap and rod end. Given liquid is to be considered incompressible, this means a closed center effectively locks the position of the actuator even if the cylinder is in mid-stroke. This could be used to park an object or otherwise maintain position. In a perfect world, one could indefinitely hold this position regardless of applied load. However, in the real world, anticipate a bit of drift due to leakage between the movable internal components. For this reason, other supplementary components are often used to maintain position rather than relying on the spool internal to a directional control valve to do so. We'll discuss these applications in later lectures. For now, let's just say that the actuator is locked in the closed center position. From the perspective of the P and T ports, the closed center position is also viewed as a blocked port by the pump. And if the stupid pump keeps pumping and pumping, the pressure relief valve actuates and dumps flow bound for nowhere to tank. The relief valve essentially wastes energy that the pump and prime mover went to the trouble of converting to fluid power. This is to suggest that the closed center position isn't exactly the most elegant of solutions for applications in which significant idle time occurs. Additionally, notes the limits of travel when the cylinder is fully extended, flow has no place to go. Pressure rises until the pressure relief valve actuates and relieves pressure. Similarly, when the cylinder bottoms out at full retraction, flow has no place to go, and the pressure relief valve actuates, relieving pressure. This is to suggest that efficient operation of this system doesn't stall out the actuator for any extended period of time. To resolve at least one of these scenarios, consider another type of center position known as a tandem center. Tandem center still locks the actuator position, even in mid-stroke. However, the pressure relief valve is not actuated since the P port is not blocked, but rather routed to T. The tandem center allows the pump to dump flow to tank at extremely low pressure. A tandem center might be a more efficient solution for a system that needs to lock the actuator in place and experiences significant idle time in this position. Another common center position variation is known as float center. Quite like a closed center, a float center still blocks the pump outflow and the pressure relief valve is forced to dump flow to tank. However, the actuator ports A and B are hooked to low pressure tank also. This low pressure connection allows the actuator to not maintain position, but rather float freely, hence the name. This position could allow an outside force or operator to manually reposition the actuator where it's needed. Finally, consider yet another center variation called an open center. 
The open center is quite obviously the opposite of a closed center in which every port is connected to every other port. An open center is basically a combination of both the tandem and the float. When placed in the open center position, the pressure relief valve is not actuated since pump outflow isn't blocked. Additionally, all ports are at low pressure. This low pressure connection allows the actuator to not maintain position, but rather be repositioned by an outside force. In review, a closed center locks the actuator in position, even in mid-stroke. Since pump outflow is blocked, the pressure relief valve must be in good working order since it will be routinely actuated. A tandem center also locks the actuator in position, even in mid-stroke. However, since pump outflow is routed to tank, the pressure relief valve will not be routinely actuated. A float center does not lock the actuator in position, but rather allows it to float freely, hence the name. This allows it to be repositioned by an outside force. Similar to a closed center, a float center does block pump outflow. The pressure relief valve must be in good working order, since it will be routinely actuated. Finally, an open center does not lock the actuator in position, but rather allows it to float freely and be repositioned by an outside force. Similar to a tandem center, an open center routes pump to tank, thus saving the pressure relief valve the necessity of being actuated. Finally, finally, I offer you this bonus round position known as regen. Not necessarily a center position, but rather a position of interest we'll examine in later lectures. Note the regen position routes pressurized flow to both actuator ports, A and B. Pause to consider the mind-blowing ramifications of such a connection. Would a double acting cylinder with both cap and rod end at the same pressure extend, retract, float freely, or hold position? If you know how a double acting cylinder works and you have a passing familiarity with Pascal's law, you know the answer. All you have to do is think about it. If you're struggling with the answer, allow me to throw you this bone. Equal pressure, different area. Aha! We will return to this extremely cool application in later lectures, and until then, I expect you to remain in a state of cat-like readiness. I could continue to feed you more and more exceedingly difficult and confusing examples of directional control valve configurations, but it would serve no purpose since one, by now I hope you're getting the picture, and two, most likely the ones we discussed are the most common configurations you'll run across. Sure there are others and truly unique configurations, but they're all variations on a common theme. Positions, ways, actuation method, which deactivated position is asserted by return springs offsetting or centering the valve, and whether or not the valve has any modifiers like manual overrides or detents. Let's call it good for now and continue on with the remaining contents of this lecture. If I employ odd configurations of directional control valves in later lectures, I'll try to take the time and point out the oddities. Absent in our entire discussion is an examination of the components, the valve body, internal passages, spools, poppets, springs, and seals that actually make all this stopping, starting, and changing direction of fluid flow possible. Sure, we've examined some schematic symbols, but we've yet to look inside a directional control valve and see how it functions. Let's do this quickly before I cut you loose. Note, I'll need you to don both 3D and X-ray goggles, for we are about to explore the cutaway view of a directional control valve. Keep in mind the diagrams I am about to use are the simplest of simplifications, but they get the point across quite nicely. Our example cutaway view is the internal workings of a three-position, four-way, manually actuated closed center directional control valve with both a straight through and cross connect position employing a movable component known as a spool. A spool is cylindrical in nature with raised lambs and lowered valleys. The main internal passageway machined into the valve body is also cylindrical in nature, similar to the barrel of a hydraulic cylinder. Inside the barrel resides the spool, also cylindrical in nature machine such that there exists a tiny, tiny amount of clearance between it and the barrel. The spool and barrel do not make physical contact, but rather the spool rides on a thin layer of lubricating fluid. The lubricating layer between the spool and barrel also serves to seal the passageways. Sometimes dynamic seals like O-rings on the spool can be used to ensure that leakage is kept to a minimum. The raised lands prohibit connection and the lowered valleys allow connection. As the spool slides the length of the barrel, 
the land selectively block passages, at the same time the valleys selectively open others. The position of the spool, as dictated by the actuation method, therefore determines the position of the valve. Schematically, the closed center blocks all ports. The straight through position routes P to A and B to T, and the cross connect position routes P to B and A to T. As we'll learn, our cutaway diagram does the same. The cutaway view shows that the spring centered spool blocks any connection between any ports P, T, A, or B when the manual lever is not actuated. When the spool is moved into the straight through position by the manual lever, the valleys connect P to A and B to T. At the same time, the lands block P to B and A to T. In contrast, when the spool is pushed into the cross connect position by the manual lever, the valleys connect P to B and A to T. At the same time, the lands block P to A and B to T. Our cutaway diagram therefore serves the same function as our schematic symbol. Here's all three positions simultaneously. Other configurations like tandem, float, or open center would require either different internal passageways, different spools, or both. I'll not go into these details since I'm hoping this simple example gets the point across quite nicely. Long story short, as the spool slides the length of the barrel, the land selectively block passages, at the same time the valleys selectively open others. The position of the spool, as dictated by the actuation method, therefore determines the position of the valve. Very earlier in this lecture, I mentioned other symbols internal to the position boxes beyond dead end T's and arrows. Additional symbols include, but are not limited to, flow control restrictions and check valves. Since we were just looking at a cutaway diagram, let's examine one of these modifications, flow control restrictions, right now. Flow control valves are restrictions or narrowing of a passageway. We'll examine flow control valves and flow control methods in later lectures. However, a simple modification of the spool allows this feature to be integrated into a directional control valve. Our previous example of a directional control valve had three clear and definite positions. Closed center offering no flow, straight through and cross connect offering full flow. Consider however a spool with a triangular groove machined into the land. Such a spool, in addition to selectively connecting and disconnecting passages, also offers a means of varying the size of the orifice between passages. In this position, the spool blocks flow. If an operator only slightly moved the spool, only the smallest of passageways would be open in the groove, and flow rate in this direction would be minimal and actuator speed reduced. As the operator continued to push the spool in the same direction, the orifice would open more and more and flow rate would increase. Finally, in the full open position, full flow rate would be achieved through the unrestricted path. Spools aren't the only moving internal components in directional control valves. Sometimes directional control valves employ poppets. Poppet style directional control valves often employ the check valve symbol internal to position boxes. These are common in cartridge mounted, solenoid initiated, pilot operated directional control valves. The operation of these style of valves is best explained using schematic symbols rather than confusing cutaway diagram. If you'll recall from the check valves lecture, available at the Big Bad Tech channel, a pilot to open check valve, as the name implies, acts just like a regular check valve in the absence of a pilot signal. One direction is free flow, one direction is blocked. A pilot to open check valve, however, opens in both directions in the presence of a pilot signal. Poppet style directional control valves are basically one or more pilot to open check valves where the pilot pressure signal is provided by the solenoid. The solenoid is a type of linear electrical actuator similar to a cylinder with a rod. When de-energized, the solenoid doesn't push on the pilot fluid and the pilot to open check valve acts just like a regular check valve. This example has two back to back pilot to open check valves. In the absence of the solenoid initiated pilot actuated signal, both of them block flow and no flow path exists. This is functionally equivalent to a dead end T. When energized, the solenoid pushes on pilot fluid and the pilot to open check valves both open. This is functionally equivalent to a bidirectional arrow. You may ask yourself, why didn't they just use dead end T's? Wouldn't that be easier? Yes. But not only do the modified symbols clue you in on the internal construction of the directional control valve, they also keep non-technicians 
in a continual state of bewilderment. If this skill was easy, everyone would be doing it. Truly half the job of technicians is keeping non-technical peasants trembling in fear of your perceived black magic powers. Fear is an excellent motivator. Speaking of things that keep the peasants fearful, let's briefly examine pertinent data found on a directional control valve data sheet before we bring this lecture to a close. Directional control valves are typically specified as having a rate of flow and a maximum inlet pressure. This might be written right on the side of the valve. The rate of flow is a quick snapshot of the valve's performance at that specific flow rate. If you wanted to dive deeper into the valve's performance at flow rates other than the rate of flow, you'd ordinarily consult the pressure drop for different flow rates performance curve or the operating limits performance curve. The pressure drop for different flow rates performance curve shows the typical restriction pressure drop created by the valve at different flow rates. If you're at a specific flow rate, ordinarily the pressure drop across the valve should be between the two curves. If you observe a different pressure drop across the valve, the valve might be obstructed or otherwise damaged. The operating limits performance curve tells you that the maximum inlet pressure actually varies as flow rate changes. The snapshot presented by the rate of flow and maximum inlet pressure is a point on this curve. Additionally, valve specifications typically describe the amount of leakage at a certain viscosity and pressure condition with the understanding that fluid with lower viscosity, a thinner fluid, will leak more for higher pressure applications. Valve specifications also typically state the fluid compatibility, viscosity, and level of filtration required for proper operation. The valve seals must be assessed for compatibility with the temperature and fluid being used in your particular application. Most manufacturers offer a choice of nitrile, fluorocarbon, or special purpose seals. Finally, physical, connection, and cavity dimensions of the valve are often included in manufacturer data sheets. All right, I believe we covered what I intended to do for this lecture. In conclusion, this lecture introduced the directional control valve, an essential fluid power component that stops, starts, and changes flow direction, ultimately influencing the actuation direction of a fluid power actuator. We discussed the construction and operation of directional control valves, examined common schematic elements associated with directional control valves, like positions, ways, actuation methods, return springs that center or offset the valve, manual overrides and detents, applied various directional control valves to circuit examples, examined the cutaway view of a spool type directional control valve, discussed the operation of poppet style directional control valves, and examined representative performance curves on a data sheet. Remember to review these concepts as often as you need to really drive it home. Imagine how well lab will go if you know what you're doing. Thank you very much for your attention and interest, and we'll see you again during the next lecture of our series. Remember to tell your lazy lab partner about this resource, and be sure to check out the Big Bad Tech channel for additional resources and updates.